Aspen Network. China launches its second crew of three astronauts to its new space station. Blast kills more than 30 in Afghanistan's Kandahar. And tuberculosis deaths rise for the first time in more than a decade due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard and Ta live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. And tonight I'm alongside my colleague Uche, who has our business headlines. Uche. Thank you, Richard. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Bit. A telecoms infrastructure firm invests $48.9 million in 4G towers across Kenya. Dark times ahead for the global supply chain as 77% of the world's largest ports face a backlogs. Of course, all that coming up within the program for now. Back to Richard. Thank you so much, Uche. We begin in China. China has blasted off a three-person crew to its space station known as Tiangong, or Heavenly Place. The Shangzhou 13 spacecraft took off early Saturday local time, or 1623 GMT. The launch took place from the Chuanchuan Satellite Launch Center in northwest China. The three Taikonauts involved are Zhai Zhuigong, Wang Yapyang, and Ye Guangfu. Wang is expected to become the first Chinese woman on China's space station and to conduct a spacewalk. They will stay for a record six months, the longest stint in space by China. This is three months longer than the crew of the Zhangzhou 12. China aims to complete the construction of Tiangong by the end of next year. Well, six months in space will be a record for China. The three astronauts have received intensive training to prepare. CGTN spoke to a senior expert of China's manned space mission. Six months is long for a space flight. It's very demanding on the astronauts' physical and mental health, knowledge and skills, ability to self-adjust and deal with emergencies. This challenge is unprecedented for us. In response to this challenge, based on the original plan, we strengthened their physical training, including core strength and upper body strength training. Both male and female astronauts must have back and chest tolerance with eight times their own weight. They have also enhanced their abilities to deal with the psychological challenge. And we trained the crew for what they would need to do during the six months. They will stay in a more complex space station they have more tasks to perform and will spend longer time to maintain their living environment. They also need to master more space station technology, perform simulated spacewalks, operate robotic arm and conduct new experiments. We also took into account the increased probability of something going wrong during a six-month flight. For example, the system may malfunction, people may get sick. We strengthened their training of emergency response and medical self-rescue. Over the past decade, China has rolled out programs to collaborate with institutions and universities around the world, including the Tokyo University. One professor from the school is hoping China's space program will boost space science research in the near future. Let's take a look. Researchers around the globe are watching China's space program with keen interest. Professor Shinji Nakaya at Tokyo University is one such scientist hoping China's Space Station Corporation program will accelerate space science research. Most of the research in this field is a collaboration. My field of research is also done in cooperation with institutions like NASA, the European Space Agency, and JAXA. But this research and experiments, such as microgravity, aircraft experiments in space, are quite costly. We use facilities available in each country. For Japan, the Kibo module on the International Space Station, or the microgravity facility 
facility in Germany. Space development programs in China is progressing fast. About half of the world's rocket launches are from China. Since China is putting so much energy and investment in space science and space development, making it available for international cooperation programs, I think it will open more doors for space science development. Professor Nakaya says the opportunity for experiments on board China's space station could increase in the future. I think in the future, projects like the ISS could gradually shrink, and what we have now in orbit may be scaled down from what we have now. Projects like the Artemis will be smaller than the ISS. And if you want to travel far into space, considering the costs, the size and weight, it will get smaller. We may also see a decrease in experiments on the ISS in the lower Earth orbit, which means there is a chance that we rely on China's international cooperation program for future large-scale experiments. Space exploration is a costly and time-consuming project, which requires ample funding. Many countries are struggling to secure a budget to continue research. China's ambitious investment in these space programs is a source of envy. Much of the joint research is fundamental research, and I think China is investing a considerable amount in fundamental research, including research in orbit. I'm afraid we're seeing a decrease in the budget for this research in Japan. So having a considerable budget invested in these programs is quite enviable. Tokyo University is working closely with China's Tsinghua University in microgravity combustion and flame instabilities affected by vortices and acoustic waves. Professor Nakaya hopes that this research bears fruit with international research cooperation. Terence Teoshima, CGTN, Tokyo. A British lawmaker from Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Conservative Party has been stabbed to death. David Amess, the member of parliament from for South Hen West in Essex, Eastern England, was stabbed at a meeting with voters in a church. A mess's office has confirmed the death, but given no further details. Police say they have arrested a 25-year-old man in connection with the incident. Colleagues from across Parliament have expressed shock at the news and paid tribute to the 69-year-old lawmaker. The British flag above 10 Downing Street has also been lowered to half mass as a mark of respect. MS was first elected to parliament to represent Basildon in 1983. In 1997, he then stood for election in South Hen West. Casualties have been reported in an explosion in the southern city of Kandahar, Afghanistan. It's believed that as many as 32 people have been killed. Abdul Hadi has more from Kabul. This has happened during the uh, Friday prayer in Kandahar. Um, Friday is a holiday for the Muslims and Friday prayer is a special prayer which is, uh, which is performed especially on Friday. Uh, so many Muslims uh, get together to pray in mosques because Friday prayer cannot be uh, performed. Uh, if you don't go to mosque, you cannot uh, perform that. So if you perform that at home, that will be normal. Uh, prayer. So uh, it happened in the southern city of uh, Kandahar in the latest uh, reports, uh, even though the reports have been, uh, there have been various reports at the beginning, it was said that seven killed and uh, uh, 20 casualties are there, uh, but it, it is changing and the latest, uh, later it was said 16 killed and 50 wounded, while the latest update says that 33 killed and more than 60 are uh, wounded in this uh, incident. And this is the first uh, such incident which happened in the southern uh, Afghanistan. Uh, in, in Kandahar is the center of all southern uh, provinces. Uh, this is the largest city in south of the uh, country. And uh, such kind of an incident which happened last, uh, last Friday in Kunduz, which, which also was uh, the attack also happened in a, in a mosque. So this is the second one, but at the opposite side of the country. You're watching Africa Live. More news to come. Here's what's ahead. Nigeria says ISWAP leader Abu Musab al bernawi is dead. And Kenya successfully controls its worst desert locust invasion in 70 years. Africa is a continent of diversity. 
with varied climates and enchanting geography. And a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Namibia! Group 3! Namibia! Group 3! When the, the enemy advance, you retreat. When the enemy retire, you attack. This is precisely what we did. Sam Niyome is very deserving of the role of icon of the Namibian liberation struggle. There's no doubt of that. But I could not really believe that his entire tanks and armed cars and jet fighters were wiped out. Welcome back to Africa Life. Thanks for staying with us. Nigeria's military has confirmed the death of Abu Musab al-Bernawi, the leader of the terrorist group Islamic State West Africa Province. The African nation has been battling insurgency since 2009 and claims to be winning the war with its consistent onslaught against the terrorist. Philly Haza reports from Abuja, the country's capital. Well, the World Health Organization is uh, reporting that after almost a decade of successfully tackling tuberculosis, cases of the infectious disease are on the rise again. This setback may potentially begin undoing years of progress towards eradicating the treatable disease. Consequently, the WHO is calling for increased efforts in terms of investment and innovation to save millions of lives. The issue has been linked to disruptions in the health sector caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, this is because of a growing number of tuberculosis cases that are going undiagnosed and untreated. Additionally, health funds have been redirected towards the pandemic. Others have struggled to access medical services because of restrictive measures implemented to lower COVID-19 infection rates. While 66 million lives were saved due uh, to TB prevention and care since the year of 2000, the COVID-19 pandemic has reversed years of progress and efforts in the fight against tuberculosis. For the first time uh, in over a decade, WHO is reporting an increase in tuberculosis deaths. Tuberculosis is the world's second top infectious killer after COVID-19, claiming close to 4,100 lives a day. Approximately 1.5 million people died from TB in 2020, including more than... Well, for more on this, we are joined by Dr. Tui Mabawunde, a public health physician. To you, welcome to Africa Life. Thank you for joining us here on the program. Now, to what extent has COVID-19 impacted the fight against tuberculosis? Indeed, um, we've uh, had a regular, um, you know, uh, we've, we've had a regular uh, victory in a way against tuberculosis in the past 10 years. Uh, we've seen a, a gradual decrease in the number of cases of tuberculosis, especially in Africa. We've also seen that um, the multidrug resistant cases are reducing by the special efforts we've deployed to actively seek for cases of tuberculosis and treat them. But here comes, uh, in, in the year uh, uh, 2020, uh, COVID-19 came in, and then lo and behold, resources were diverted from tuberculosis to COVID-19. And we saw the triple um, problem for Africa, COVID-19, HIV AIDS, and tuberculosis. Um, what has happened essentially, as we rightly pointed out, was that resources, money meant for tuberculosis were being diverted to COVID-19 cases. Secondly, attention were being diverted away from tuberculosis to COVID-19. And thirdly, people were restricted. They were not allowed to move around. And of course, they, there was that fear 
among the people that if should I get to an hospital now, I'll be tagged a case of COVID-19. COVID-19 was a dreaded disease that brought a lot of fear, lockdown, uh, repression, depression, anxiety, and a lot of mental health with it. Um, it's been a, a gradual reduction with the global meltdown and reduction in GDPs worldwide, um, and Africa losing as much as uh, $180 billion during that year. Of, of course, 5% uh, of GDP in Nigeria was lost to COVID-19. So um, it became challenging to be able to mobilize funds to fight COVID-19. Human resources became scattered. Then people fear increased, and they were not accessing hospitals. These were critical issues that led to the rise of the cases of tuberculosis we are seeing now. And it means, essentially, that we need to rethink our strategy to fight tuberculosis, because now we're having a triad of tuberculosis, HIV, COVID-19. What do we now do, um, in a way? How do we redirect our attention to focus on how to integrate the fight, the successful fight against tuberculosis that we've been having into even the COVID-19 narrative? So this is the key public health challenge we're facing right now. Well, that, that brings me to my next question. Doctor, what do you think we can do to start to curb these infections? From your perspective, how do you see it? Now, uh, first and foremost, we know that we're already missing the target of 2022 UN um, goal to really reduce the number of cases of um, COVID-19 deaths to by 35% and active cases by 20%. We're missing that already. Now, the first thing we need to do is to actually, you know, rejig our human resources and, re and refocusing on those killer diseases, number two in the world, infectious killer in the world after COVID-19 is, is tuberculosis. So first of all, we need to really rethink the human resources. We need to mobilize fund again because fund became um, um, short in, so in supply during the COVID-19 era. So we need to actually mobilize the fund. We need to increase, we need to increase the signaling, the talking, the public health campaign to refocus our people's attention to the need to come out and then uh, get uh, tested for tuberculosis. So by mobilizing human resources, by mobilizing funds, by mobilizing information, appropriate information to the targeted community, we can achieve a lot. So um, then, because we need to uh, reduce the people's fear that whenever they are going to the hospital, they're going to be labeled as a case of COVID-19. That is critical. So what we have copious that is cheaper in this part of the world, especially in the Sub-Saharan Africa, is to actually redirect our information, improve on the communication level to bring attention to the challenges of tuberculosis. And telling people that tuberculosis, and especially about drug resistance, is killing is number two killer disease, killing four, more than 400,000 people every blessed day. And that a case of active tuberculosis will infect eight people every day. We have to really increase the communication so that people can then come forward and get treated and get tested. All right, doctor, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for uh, lending your perspective to this conversation. Much appreciated. Now, as we have just reported, Nigeria's military has confirmed the death of Abu Musab al Barnawi, the leader of the terrorist group Islamic State West Africa province. Here is once again CGTN's Philly Haza with more on this from Abuja. Phil. Abu Musab al banawi was reported to have been killed last month by locals in Bornu State, northeast Nigeria, but this is the first time it's been confirmed by the Nigerian military. Top military commander and chief of defense staff, General Loki Rabo, confirmed the news but did not give details on how exactly al banawi was killed or when it happened. Of course, I can authoritatively confirm to you that um, um, al banawi is dead. As soon as that is dead and remains dead. Insecurity or threat, as it were, either terrorism, banditry, or any form of um, criminality, it is, they are not confined to boundaries. And, and this reason why, when we um, speak to issues that have to do with our national security, is placed in contest with our neighbors. Because if all is where at home and all is not where with our neighbors, then of course we can't have peace. So this is the reason why collectivism has become an approach in, 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 this, in this regard. 
The group ISWAP has not confirmed the death, but the news is coming months after Abubakar Shekau, the leader of rival faction Boko Haram, was confirmed dead in May. Albanawi was the son of the founder of Niger's Boko Haram militant group, Mohammed uh, Yusuf. The insurgents have waged war against the Nigerian state for nearly 12 years now. According to the United Nations, more than 35,000 people have been killed and over 2 million more displaced from their homes since the war began. The Nigerian government says it has intensified attacks on insurgents, dealing a big blow to the group. So far, officials say more than 6,000 of them, including their families, have laid down their arms and surrendered. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja. Kenya has successfully controlled its desert locust invasion, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. In 2019, Kenya experienced its worst invasion in 70 years. The FAO said the East African nation was considered locust-free in late August 2021, as CGTN's Joy Karuki Juma tells us. The desert locust invasion. When the locust invasion came to this country, it was a menace. We will hear it all over the news, on the televisions. The food security of thousands of people was at risk in the country. The pests devoured the crops and pastures at a devastating speed. When a family goes to the farm and what they had farmed has been eaten up by the desert loggers, this means there is going to be hunger. Our children cannot go to school hungry. The Kenya government was supported by the Food and Agriculture Organization to contain the locusts. Over 1,000 community scouts, environment, health and safety experts, agricultural officers and members of the National Youth Service were trained to stop the invasion. We were trained on how to gather information on their behavior, on their movement and how to even fight them. The data NYS gathered was sent to the country's Desert Locust Information Service using FAO's handheld GPS-based data recording and transmission device. The device is designed for use in difficult and remote locations where monitoring and network is a challenge. This was a very good experience. Since this Desert Locust menace came into our country, the National Youth Service has been in the forefront and the delivery has been so well, because if the National Service didn't go outside there, the kind of destruction that we would have experienced would have been vast. Now, it was timely that we went outside there, and the delivery was, I can say, 100%. Kenyan locals were also trained how to harvest locusts. The pests were milled for the production of animal feed and organic fertilizer. Through efforts like this, FAO and governments in East Africa say they saved some 4.4 million metric tons of cereals from destruction. Joy Kiruki Juma, CGTN. The news continues on Africa Live. Time now for our business segment with Uche. Over to you, Uche. Thanks, Richard. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. A telecoms infrastructure firm invests $48.9 million in 4G towers across Kenya. And dark times ahead for the global supply chain as 77% of the world's largest ports face backlogs. taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time it's exciting, it's new, it's different, it's a challenge. Woo! It's really exciting. <laughs>
Qualcomm now shared telecoms infrastructure is gaining momentum here in Kenya. That is, as Atlas Tower Kenya plans to invest about $48.9 million to install 4G towers across the country. They will be targeting mobile network operators such as Safaricom, uh, Airtel Kenya, and of course, Telcom Kenya. All three telcos are aiming to cover the country with the fourth generation broadband cellular technology in order to attract and retain subscribers. Now the challenge is maintaining and upgrading their own infrastructure, which of course doesn't come cheap. Mobile network operators are increasingly moving to lease uh, towers from independent providers who can serve uh, multiple clients, giving the telcos an opportunity to cut costs and also to focus on acquiring and serving subscribers with various services. And moving on now, Pan-African Industrial Parks developer Arise IIP says that the Gabon, Gabon Special Economic Zone has just become the world's first SGS neutral carbon industrial zone. Now this landmark achievement comes a month before the 26th, 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of Parties, which is scheduled to be held in Glasgow on October 31st. Well, let's now delve into Gabon's environmental plans in light of all this. We're joined by Lee White, the country's environment minister. Great to have you with us uh, on the show today, uh, Mr. White. Now, of course, uh, let's start off with uh, Gabon's uh, uh, environmental plans going forward. Uh, give us more insight into the standards and, of course, the best pr practices that you implemented uh, at the Gabon Special Economic Zone uh, that allowed you to achieve this carbon neutral industrialization in many ways it's actually a carbon positive story um, we we created a public private partnership with with olam and arise within which the Gabonese government is the major shareholder and what we're trying to do in that industrial zone is to develop sustainable timber transformation so based on sustainable forestry and so we're using the economic zone to, if you want to, to save our forests by exploiting the forests and, and giving it sustainable value within Gabon. We've, we've, we've made that zone a, a carbon neutral zone, but we're also making all of the industries that feed into that zone, whether it's oil palm, which is carbon neutral in Gabon, and, and then the forestry, which actually is carbon positive which makes Gabon, which is 88% covered by rainforest, one of the most carbon positive countries on, on, on the planet. And, and that economic zone is helping us to sustain that carbon positivity, um, to sustain the standing rainforests and, and, to, and to keep sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to protect the world. Right. And Professor, in light of all this, uh, Gabon is seen as sort of leading the way in Africa uh, when it comes to environmental issues. Uh, you also became the first African country to receive payments uh, for reducing your carbon emissions. Uh, and you say your plan is to become a green superpower on the, uh, on the continent and globally going forward. How so? That was actually the Financial Times um, um, Kind of title the green superpower but 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 absolutely what we're trying to do is to to find a new a new economic de development model for africa traditionally africa is a source of cheap raw materials and when you're sending cheap logs um you know out to out of the african continent you, your natural resources don't have value for the for the for the people so by transforming our natural resources, we're giving them value. By giving them value, we make them precious to, to the people of Gabon and to the government of Gabon. Uh, and in that way, we think we can improve environmental governance. We can maintain our, our rainforest, maintain the integrity of our, of our ecosystems, um, restore our coastal ecosystems that have been damaged by, by unsustainable fishing. Um, and all of that makes Gabon a country which is environmentally sustainable. It makes us a country that is, that is in terms of carbon, carbon positive, absorbing um, about a third of France's annual emissions every year. 
And what we're trying to do now through the UNFCCC is to turn those carbon sequestrations into Paris compliant carbon credits um, such that Gabon can help other countries that, that have more problems reducing their emissions um, to, to, to be compliant with the, the engagement that we all have under the Paris Protocol to, to try and get down to carbon neutrality. Mm. And of course, you just uh, recently passed a law uh, in relation to this, allowing uh, the country to trade in those carbon credits. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you plan to implement it? We passed a climate change law, which builds on our sustainable development law that we passed in 2014. Um, our, our vision for, for carbon is that all carbon has to be measured nationally to avoid problems of leakage and double counting. And so we're creating a national carbon registry, a national carbon market. Um, all carbon credits created in Gabon will have to go through our national registry so we have visibility on, on, on everything. And then we will look to, to see if we cannot link our registry to other registries around the world so that a part, a, 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 a portion of the carbon credits that we're creating in Gabon could be exchanged on an international exchange subject to the rules that we're going to agree on at the COP in Glasgow, hopefully in two weeks' time. Mm. Now, of course, we're heading towards uh, the COP26, uh, and Gabon currently is the chair of the African Group of Negotiators on Climate Change. Uh, so in light of that, uh, what do you plan to negotiate at that meeting, and how do you think uh, the impact of COVID-19 will impact that negotiation process, uh, and of course the positions and concerns that African nations will put forward? I think COVID makes this COP fairly unpredictable because we haven't had the, the negotiating time to prepare um, all of the text that normally we would. Um, and so we're going into Glasgow a little bit cold and coming out with a, a result is gonna depend on all countries being, being ready to compromise and, 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 and do uh, two months worth of work in, in, in the two weeks that we have in Glasgow. For Africa, there are some very key points. Um, the first thing that Africa wants to see is, is the developed world honor the pledge for 100 billion US dollars a year of, 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 of financing for, for climate change, both for adaptation and, and mitigation, because we see that as a real mark of, 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 of trust. Um, for Africa, adaptation is, is extremely important. Africa is the continent that's going to be the worst impacted by, by climate change already hundreds of thousands, millions of people are being affected by, by drought and, 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 and hunger because of failed crops. Um, and so financing for, to, 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 to help developing countries to adapt to the, 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 this problem that, that we haven't created. Africa's um, contributed 3% of the emissions, but it's, it's, it's the continent that's having to spend the most um, trying to adapt our economies and adapt, adapt our cities, adapt our, 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 our agricultural methods to climate change. So, that, so those are the two big points for, 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 uh, for Africa and, and that Gabon will be pushing as the chair of the African Group of Negotiators. Well, we do have to leave it there, Professor. Many thanks for joining us uh, today on the show. That, of course, was Professor Lee White, uh, Gabon's Environment Minister. And moving on now, a supply chain crisis around the world. In the UK, the port of Felix Stowell has now run out of storage space for containers. That's amid a shortage of heavy goods vehicle drivers and a surge in imports ahead of Christmas. While in California, there has been long-standing congestion with container ships waiting weeks to offload. Uh, here's Andrew Wilson with the latest. Britain, it seems, is not alone. The container jams, like the one at Felixstowe Port, are being seen around the world. In the UK, there are added domestic complications with HGV drivers and so on, but it's clear now that everyone is wrestling with a global supply chain crisis. I, I want to take a moment to reflect on the work that we started. In when Washington, we were... G7 finance ministers wrapped up proceedings in agreement that they faced a global challenge that was best tackled together. Agreement.
Well, I tell people, you know, to be reassured that we're doing absolutely everything we can to mitigate some of these challenges. They are global in nature, so we can't fix every single problem, but I feel confident that there'll be good provision of goods for everybody, and we are working our way to remove blockages where we can. The headline crisis is perhaps the long-standing congestion in California, where an armada of container ships lies idle, waiting weeks to offload in Los Angeles and Long Beach. The White House has now announced a new 24-7 shift pattern to tackle it, with a clear presidential call to national transportation networks to step up as well. The rest of the world is closing in, and we risk losing our edge if we don't step up. In order to be globally competitive, we need to improve our capacity to make things here in America, while also moving finished products across the country and around the world. We need to think big and bold. Shipping costs are five times what they were last year. In the UK, the lack of truck drivers is biting hard, and analysts are still predicting a difficult winter. Global or not, the government is choosing to remain buoyant in public. Well, the, the, the situation is uh, improving. I'm confident that people will be able to get their, their toys for, for Christmas. As I say, I, I quite understand why people are concerned by these headlines, but we are working through these challenges as we have worked through other challenges. But there's no doubt that the pandemic has unearthed some extraordinary weaknesses in how the world does business and collateral damage in some sectors will be unavoidable. Andrew Wilson, CGTN. And that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But still to come on Global Business Africa, South Africa's state firms lose billions of dollars due to copper theft. We'll bring you all that at the top of the hour for now. Back to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Uche. We're not done just yet. We've got your sports news coming up after the break. Here's a peek at the headlines. Egypt champions Zamelik wary of Kenya's Tusker FC's threat ahead of their CAF Champions League clash in Nairobi. How would you create your legend? On the fields, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, fine. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome into Sport in Africa Live. We kick off with the CAF Champions League, where Egyptian champions Zamalek are in Nairobi to take on Kenyan title holders Tusker FC in the first leg of their second round qualifier on Saturday. Zamalek are among the African club football heavyweights that will join the elite competition at this stage. The White Knights from Cairo trained at the Yayo National Stadium match venue on Friday morning as they seek to qualify to the lucrative group stages of the Champions League. However, Zamalek will not remember their last game in Nairobi fondly after they were stunned 4-2 by the Kenyan champions Gora Mahaya in the CAF Confederations Cup. Head coach Patrice Carter Carteron said his team will do their best to lead with a first leg advantage considering that his star players are only just returning from international duty with Egypt. You know in football, especially in Champions League, we all know that uh, you have a lot of good teams in Africa and it's uh, really hard to, if you are not ready 100% mentally, especially, especially, we know uh, it can be a hard game. So. We, uh, we do prepare ourselves as best as we can regarding the circumstances to, to have a good result. Of course, we want to qualify for the next round in the Champions League, so we know we have to beat the champion of Kenya. That uh, is not easy, but uh, we respect this opponent, but we want to win, of course. Meanwhile, Tusker FC coach Robert Matano says they have the momentum ahead of their CAF Champions League clash against Amalek. Matano and his team trained at the match venue on Friday afternoon, confident that they can cause a huge upset against the five-time African club champions on Saturday. Tusker beat Arthur Solar, seven of Djibouti, four to one on aggregate to sail into the second round, 
where they landed a glamour tie against Amalek. Matano and his captain Eugene Asike believe they have enough in their ranks to trouble the Cairo Giants as they rallied local fans to get behind the team that will start the match as massive underdogs. The winners of the two-leg tie will advance to the group stages of the competition with the loser dropping to the second tier CAF Confederations Cup. We are ready as Tasca and we are Kenya, we are present the country. We, are, we must make our country be proud because of tomorrow's match. Zamalek is a good team, they are champions of Africa, but they are beatable. So as I select my players, ready to play with the Zamalek, and our intention is to win here so that we can plan for next match. Yes, they are champions, they are also champions. So <clears throat> we are going out there. For us, we know it's a, it's a good side with quality players, with experienced players. But once we walk onto that field, I believe it will be 11 against 11. We, work, we have our work well cut out. And we need to, to go out there and give our all, believe in ourselves, show great teamwork and great team spirit tomorrow's game. Yeah? In total, seven games are on the cards in the CAF Champions League qualifiers round two first leg fixtures on Saturday. In some of the other matches, title holders and record champions Al Ali of Egypt are away to USGN of Niger, while Tunisian side Etoile du Sahel will make the trip to Rwanda to face APR. Asek Mimosa of Cote d'Ivoire faced a daunting home tie against last season's quarterfinalist CR Belazadad of Algeria. Well, I guess that's it for this edition of Africa Live. Remember, you can send us your feedback to the contacts on the screen and follow us on digital media platforms. For the team, I'm Richard Searle and Toss saying thank you so much for watching. And we'll be right back here, same time tomorrow. Till then, take care.